Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Plante webinar on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on graduate students' mental health. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I would like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code webinar10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. Today's webinar was organized by ASPB's Early Career Plant Scientists Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Subcommittee. If you are an early career plant scientist, I would like to encourage you to join this section as well. Membership is only $5 and is a great way to get engaged. You can join this group even if you are not already an ASPB member. In a few moments, I will share a link to their network on Plante so you can learn a little bit more and get connected. Great. Patrick Thomas, who is currently the head of the Early Career Plant Scientist Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Subcommittee, and who is also a PhD candidate at the University of California, Riverside, is here with us today to share a little bit more about the ES ECPS section and introduce today's topic and speaker. Before we even get started, I'd like to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Patrick for leading the charge and setting up this webinar and very important topic for all of us. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Patrick Thomas. I am a graduate student wrapping up at the University of California in Riverside, and it is a pleasure to come to you as the head of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Subcommittee for ECPS. And what we seek out to do is um, particularly with underrepresented folk, but for the um, for the section in general, we provide programming uh, to highlight our underrepresented scientists and to support them in any ways that we can. We do this through a series of game nights, uh, writing rooms. We do this also through some underrepresented by bi underrepresented minority bios that you might have seen on our ASPB ECPS Twitter, which I can drop the link to in the chat. Um, in a few minutes. But today, what I am here to present to you is part one of a two part series where the ECPS committee thought, uh, how can we reach out to the section at large and provide some resources to better tackle some of the um, societal issues that we've seen throughout the pandemic? Um, or the systemic issues that we've seen that need to be changed. And we decided on a two-parter to tackle um, mental health and policy. And um, the first part of the seminar is the part that you're at today. And this is going to be focusing on systemic changes that we can make um, to tackle mental health at universities and other academic institutions. And we're hoping to arm early career researchers with some tools to better ask their institutions to support them so that we can all be the best researchers and the best people that we can be. So with that, I'm very, very, very excited um, to introduce Dr. Sharon Milgram, who is the director of the Office of Intramural Training and Education at the National Institute of Health. And I'm just going to give a quick bio for her. She received her bachelor's degree in physical therapy from Temple University and a PhD in cell biology from Emory University in Georgia. She completed her postdoctoral training at the Johns Hopkins University before joining the faculty at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. There, she rose to the rank of full professor in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology. Dr. Milgram currently, Dr. Milgram, my apologies, served as the Associate Director of the Medical Scientist Training Program, the Director of the Interdisciplinary Biomedical Sciences Graduate Program, and the Director of the Summer Undergraduate Research Experience. In 2017, in 2007, she joined the NIH Office of the Director as the Director of the Office of Intramural Training and Education where she directs a trans NIH office dedicated to the career advancement of over 5,000 trainees. 
Dr. Milgram lectures widely on science careers, mentorship, leadership, and management in research environments. And she currently lives in Tacoma Park, Maryland with her wife and son. And with that, I am very excited to turn the um, room over to Dr. Sharon Milgram, where uh, she will be giving us a very exciting talk about how institutions can better tackle mental health. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Patrick and Katie for the invitation and all of you um, who uh, took an hour out of your busy time uh, to talk about this important topic. I am um, going to talk today about uh, a holistic approach to supporting biomedical trainees. Um, I'll be uh, providing information on some programs that are available to you uh, through the NIH, talking in general about what institutions and individuals and societies and communities uh, could be thinking about in all of this. And I hope that we'll have some time uh, for questions. Let me just say up front, for whatever reason, the dog is antsy today. Uh, so Teo is sitting right behind me and he apologizes in advance for the barking. If it gets too bad, I'll uh, unplug and try to find another uh, place where I can uh, get away from him. I think it goes without saying that we are all really uh, changed uh, by the experience we're going through now. I think none of us uh, at the start of all of this imagined that 20 months later, uh, we would be worried about vaccine hesitancy, that we would be uh, seeing numbers go up and down, that we would be marking devastating uh, numbers of deaths due to the pandemic, both here in the US uh, and internationally. We've had to face really difficult uh, data on health disparities of the pandemic. In the midst of all of this, we have seen uh, really extremely toxic uh, political discourse. Uh, we are uh, facing a national reckoning around uh, discrimination, uh, racism, uh, and inappropriate uh, violence against black and brown people. We are looking at climate change uh, and seeing us move closer and closer to the point where there's no turning back. We have lived through a remarkable amount. Still trying to get work done, publish papers, uh, defend your thesis, um, do good science, take care of each other, et cetera. So, you know, we're all changed. And my gut feeling is that uh, like me, many of you are looking to make meaning out of this really difficult experience. And I think one way as humans that we make meaning out of really difficult uh, times is we look uh, to make sure that something positive comes of it. For me, in thinking about my role first as a researcher, uh, and mentor, and now as an educator who mentors trainees uh, at all educational levels. For me, I've come to appreciate that what I really want to see come out of this uh, is a really thoughtful discussion about the mental health crisis that uh, our community is facing. While early papers focused on graduate students, we see similar data uh, in the postdoc community. This paper here, which uh, uh, is uh, a summary in the Guardian of a study done by the Wellcome Trust in the UK. This study shows that 53% of all participants at various uh, levels from uh, staff and PI down to trainees had said that they felt the extreme stress of their work and had wished to seek support for that. You cannot separate the racism and the disparities and the unwelcoming climates from issues around health and well being. We can't separate the harassment, both sexual and otherwise, from this topic. The honest truth is there are many wonderful things about the research community, but there are many disappointing things the things we tolerate in the name of good science. So for me, one of the things that I hope comes out of the pandemic for me, for my equals in leadership positions, for people along the entire continuum from early career scientists to very senior leaders is 
is that we start looking at our actions day in and day out, and we ask ourselves, what are we doing through our actions and inactions to perpetuate cultures where incivility, bullying, harassment, and discrimination can flourish? You can't be healthy and well in a community where you feel devalued, unwelcome, and unsafe. And so I think we can't have a discussion about trainee health and well being, about trainee mental health and resilience without having this broader discussion. I think we need to start seeing the whole person, not the hands with pipettes or hands with keyboard. You know, everyone who is integral to the success of this system, from students and postdocs and other trainees, faculty support staff, we need to be looking at the whole individual. We also need to start seeing people first and scientists second. Even if we prefer not to acknowledge that, you know, even if we say our entire identity is wrapped up in our science, which some people say, um, even with that, we really need to let go of that idea and appreciate that we are people first. Many trainees are emerging adults, figuring out all kinds of things about life, who to love, where to live, to separate or not from the religion of our uh, families of origin, all kinds of things in terms of sort of stepping into adulthood. And all trainees are emerging scientists, meaning they're figuring out what do I want to do with this love of STEM? How do I want to pursue a career? How, what careers are right for me? Furthermore, lots of PIs are emerging managers and leaders in a system where very few of us have had enough training in self and relationship management. You know, we focus on subject matter expertise, and then we ask people to work on complex teams, right? And then we ask people to manage complex teams, and we do it with very little training. The bottom line is no one wants to come to work and leave a part of who they are at the door, at the gate. You know, you swipe your badge, you don't leave your identity behind. And the honest truth is what happens outside of work rarely stays outside of work. So um, all the things we deal with in our personal life come into work and uh, can make it hard to focus, make progress uh, etc. And we really need to start seeing ourselves as the whole complex people that we are. I think we also need to see the system for what it is. And these are some quotes from webinars that I've done with students where they talk about the, the research enterprise, the academic space, right? High knowledge, high intensity, high stress, lots of failure, criticism, and disappointment. We put the problem before the people, publish or perish, right? What a really harsh assessment uh, of, of somebody's career trajectory, because let's be honest, takes a lot to get a paper pulled together. Uh, lots of science doesn't go anywhere. So we have to start over. So publish or perish, right? The cream rises to the top, which really means they really only want the cream. Good or real scientists have to think about science all the time. This enterprise is set up with only some people in mind, and it makes me choose between me as a person and me as a scientist. I think if these are the stories that we are all carrying with us day to day to work, then it is extremely difficult to be really well. It makes sense to me that we see issues with mental health and well being. We saw them before the pandemic. And of course, the stress, uncertainty, and loneliness of the pandemic have exacerbated it. And then all of those other things that I talked about. So, in some way, I think we have to look at the fact that the system drives a lack of well being and a lack of. Um, a lack of care uh, for ourselves as people. We work in a system that makes it hard to seek help. And in this case, I ask students, what are the barriers that keep you from using potentially helpful resources, even things like writing courses or going to see a career counselor? I wasn't talking about what is it that makes it hard for you to seek help uh, for your mental health. I was talking in general. And look at this, fear, shame, 45%, no time, way uh, under, right? This is a system 
that tells its participants somehow you have to hide anything you don't do well. Asking for help using resources is a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength. So if we want to change the culture of science, and if we want to improve trainee health and well-being, including mental health, we have to tackle the fact that this system sends messages from the start that tell people to hide what's hard for them. We have a wellness assessment that we do here at NIH. I do it with trainees uh, nationally now that I have so much chance to visit universities uh, and scientific societies by webinar where we look at our physical, uh, mental, emotional, and spiritual health with some uh, um, uh, specific questions to help people get at what do we mean about this. And I'm going to give you a link if you want to do it later, but I just want to show you the data. This is mental health, right? With number one being, I'm really struggling. I don't do any of these healthy things. And I do a lot of these unhealthy things all the time, up to five, which is I'm taking care of myself pretty well. So the best that we see is in the realm of physical health and well being, a 3.3 on a scale of five, mental health 2.6 on a scale of five. Something that really, um, worries me is we did this with, this was a mix of graduate students and postdocs. We did this with high school students during our virtual summer internship program. And we saw essentially the same, same responses. And I apologize for Teo and hopefully this will work out okay. So we're struggling. Trainees are struggling to take care of themselves. And I think that we have to look at this and really think what needs to change. The honest truth is that change will take an integrated approach at the individual level, at the department level, at the university uh, and institutional level, and in the broader scientific community. We need ourselves to spend some time reflecting on why it is that we don't take care of ourselves, what's hard, what keeps us from doing it. We need to learn and make change. As groups, we need to reflect and learn together. We need to have discussions that lead to new policies and community agreements that drive culture change, where we hold each other accountable, but more importantly, support each other. And we need support for change at all levels and by all stakeholders, including funders, um, federal agencies like the NIH, right? I think that a part of this change is building a culture of wellness. And it needs to be based on the agreement that time for wellness is a right and not an extra. And it's certainly not something that detracts from your worth as a scientist. I also think that we need to build a common language and a set of models that resonate in the community. You know, when you say wellness, if you asked 100 people what wellness means, you'd get all kinds of different answers. And in fact, in some ways, wellness has been co-opted by a broader discussion, you know, of like wellness is spa days. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not exactly what resonates for our community. I'm trying to use the word well being a lot more than wellness, um, but I will flip back and forth. I like this model because to me, it shows the link between. Uh, wellness and civility and anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, anti-bullying programs. And that is that we all work, walk through this world and our nervous system is sort of cycling constantly uh, from more excited states to somewhat less excited or depressed states, right? And, and our hope is that it cycles within this zone that Dr. Dan Siegel calls the window of tolerance. And that's the zone where we function well. We find our creative problem solving self, whether that's to address uh, reviews of a paper that didn't go well, or that is to address a really big complication in experimental design. But we can put aside our stress, we can focus, and we can put our intellectual uh, gifts to work solving problems. 
This is also the zone where we address interpersonal issues calmly and respectfully, whether that is how to talk to someone about microaggressions, how to navigate sharing cell culture in the PCR space, how to talk about uh, things that happen between you and your PI or you and a colleague. It's a zone where we can calmly address issues. We respond most productively to stress in this zone. The thing is that sometimes our nervous system is hyper excited and we hit this reactive zone where we are snarky and unkind, where we lash out, or where we bottle it all up, but we are totally not thinking effectively at all. We make completely unhelpful, irrational decisions. Or our nervous system is hypo excited. We've had a lot of negative experiences and we've sort of given up and it's sort of the free zone or the give up and ignore zone. We know we need to go in and address the, the comments of our committee. We know we need to go have a conversation with someone. We know we need help and support for whatever it is, but we don't have the energy to do anything. The beauty of this model is it's a window, right? So it, it implies that we can work to make this a pretty broad window. It also implies that the window can slam shut, but we can pull it back open. And so to me, it gives us uh, insight into why taking care of ourselves is important. All right. And that, I think, is the first conversation that needs to happen. Right. We're not convinced that taking care of ourselves will lead to anything good because the messages like publish or perish, science 24-7, I, I can't count the number of times somebody has said to me, if you're not thinking about science while you're in the shower, there's got to be something uh, you know, wrong, right? We have, we have been barraged by messages that say, don't take time to take care of yourself. You are hands with pipettes, hands with keyboards. Two really key <laughs> phrases I like to use a lot. To do well, we have to be well. None of us are our creative problem solving self when we are burned out, when we haven't had a vacation. But really importantly, in these really complex times we live in, to treat others well, we have to be well ourselves, right? We can't solve interpersonal problems. We can't build really welcoming and inclusive diverse teams until we start valuing the well-being of ourselves and others. And so that has led me, and this started long before the pandemic, but it has led me to think a lot about putting together a wellness or well-being program for NIH trainees, which we now uh, have really brought together with resilience or the ability to persist through setback. And so I asked myself a lot, what would a top-notch well-being and resilience program look like uh, for academics, biomedical trainees, uh, or um, STEM trainees in general? I mean, what would it really look like? So the first thing is we have to build programs designed specifically for the community and accounting for different lived experiences, different views of well-being, right? Culturally, we all have messages about how we take care of ourselves. Stigma is really surrounded around, uh, you know, stigma around mental health, around taking time to take care of yourself. Stigma stems from fear. Stigma is actually fear of losing something. And in this case, given that we're working in such a high knowledge environment, the stigma of taking care of yourself, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to try to get away from him. Um, the stigma of taking care of yourself is really rooted in loss of position in terms of all of that high knowledge work we do. Will people think less of me? Will they give me fewer great projects? I'm going to try the stairwell and hope that works. All right. Another thing is there is no one way to do uh, wellness. It's different for all of us. So we need lots of entry points to reduce barriers to access. We really need a program that gives people a chance to get in at different ways. And we need to provide training for all stakeholders. And it's got to be regular and ongoing. Wellness week or wellness day or wellness hour is not enough in a community that is so skewed 
uh, towards anti-well-being messages. And when I say all stakeholders, this is trainees, this is students, this is staff, this is PIs. There is this idea out there that uh, only the PIs need training, right? And there is truth to the fact that PIs drive a lack of wellness in our community. And I would say I needed training as a PI. There is no doubt that we need training. But the honest truth is that students need training as well. I'm going to point out something, and that is that I heard about 150 people were registered for this and 47 are here. A lot of times we see topics like this and we say, oh, that's really important. I'm going to go to that. I call that an aspirational uh, reservation, right? But look how many are here. Now, some might watch it later. Some probably uh, uh, will forget about it uh, and have already forgotten about it. All of us need to commit to training. Furthermore, we have to draw those ties between a wellness program and between our uh, support for uh, well being. We have to put it into the broader context of our discussions on anti racism behaviors and on building welcoming and inclusive communities. They are inextricably linked. If you do not feel welcome in your community, you cannot feel well. We need to develop rigorous civility programs and we have to proactively address unsupportive microenvironments, laboratories, which drive toxic culture, right? Nobody can thrive in those types of environments. And one last thing, I think, in terms of the broader culture, we need to really push back against the notion that there's a hierarchy of value in one career over another, right? It's better to be an academic than go to industry. Oh, people who go to science policy, right? They really didn't uh, have what it takes. We need to value all career outcomes. I'm really sorry, I'll try to get further away. Um, we moved and this house is just not quite as well set up for hiding from the dog as our previous house was. All right, you're getting to see our very, very messy house though. Well, hopefully not too much of it. All right, so that's a little bit of my uh, thoughts about what we need to do. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the evolution of our program with the hope that it gives you a sense of the kinds of things you might ask for. And I wanna say that we started with a philosophy and that is that our trainees are whole people with unique strengths and vulnerabilities and that the honest truth is they have persisted in this space for a long time. They have the ability to thrive and they can deal with adversity. Not to say it's always easy, but the potential is there. But we are responsible for setting them up for success with four things. First, by helping them find mentors and supportive environments. Second, by promoting their ability to bring their whole self to work. Third, by providing access to critical information and resources. And fourth, by helping them put all of this together to take better care of themselves. While knowing that something, you know, wake up one day, something happens and suddenly people need additional support. And this is a really key thing. We can't view trainee mental health issues as a disease, right? What we need to do is develop a program that promotes wellness, that helps people deal with situational stressors and emergencies and helps people access critical mental health resources when they're needed. So it really is a three-pronged approach. And I think one of the mistakes we're making is we are looking at this as disease, right? What we need to be doing is flipping this and saying, we need to all take care of ourselves. Part of taking care of ourselves is strong mental health support but we also want to look at mental well-being, physical well-being, et cetera. We know from the pandemic and before some protective factors. Protective factors mean if you have access to these things, you tend to do better. And the first is the development of positive coping styles. This means that you have training in resilience, in stress management and well-being. Somebody actually 
talks with our community about what that looks like. Just like we take time to learn about the science of our field, we have to take time to learn about the science of resilience. These are learned skills and they take some time to develop actually because most of us have learned pretty bad habits in this regard. We need to embed this in the curriculum and life of the community. If you wanna make change for current students, ask your school to have a wellness uh, talk or a resilience talk at orientation, right? And throughout, you need to hear it more than once, but people really need to hear it from the start. We need to incentivize people to go, whether that be trainees or PIs. And furthermore, those of you who go need to become advocates, right? That this was helpful. You can explain uh, what you learned. You can talk about it. You know, it's not 100% trainees responsibility. I think a lot of this should fall on the shoulders of others. But if trainees don't engage, programs don't happen. Another thing that is a protective factor is social support. So we are hardwired to connect and people do not thrive when they are isolated and alone. So we need affinity groups for trainees and staff. This helps with diversity and inclusion initiatives, but it also helps with uh, wellness initiatives because we all need to feel a member of groups uh, to feel uh, good about ourselves. We need to have formal and informal structures for welcoming newcomers. And I think there are many unique stressors that we knew about before the pandemic, but I think we have seen uh, and talked about much more openly. Uh, trainees who are parents, uh, trainees of color, trainees uh, with neurodiversity, trainees with chronic illness, women scientists in uh, many, many fields, uh, even where uh, numbers wise, they are not underrepresented often uh, face barriers. So we need to provide ways for people to get together and talk with others within their community and ways for people to talk with allies across communities. It is a huge protective factor for mental health to feel a part of multiple communities. Look at this number three, time to rest and recharge. In a community that doesn't like to take vacations, but the honest truth is that we are not able to work 24-7 years and years and years and years in a row. We need more time off. Graduate students need to take time off. Postdocs need to take time off. Staff, PIs, all of us. Furthermore, if you can advocate for policy change on your campus, advocate for parental leave, bereavement policy, and medical leave, because these are hard things to do in our culture. And these are times where people need to really pause. We've learned a lot about stopping the clock during the pandemic. We found ways to be flexible now. We can find ways uh, to take care of this in the future. If there is no vacation policy for graduate students and postdocs, ask your administrators why, because there should be. In the absence of a policy, people assume they're not supposed to take leave. And if there is a policy, someone at the top needs to send out emails and remind people. The fourth protective factor is quality mentoring relationships. For trainees, I think a part of this is appreciating how difficult some mentoring environments are. And we all need to start talking about the fact that we can't make science the only factor or quite frankly, the first factor in lab placements. We need to start from the first principle of, will I be well cared for in that environment? When the shit hits the fan, will I be supported? So while I'm not advocating for ignoring science, I wonder why science comes first. We also need to develop quality training for PIs and other staff, and we need to really provide support for trainees and PIs to engage in building quality relationships. It takes work on both sides to navigate the complexity of a research relationship, especially given the hierarchy and the environment that you work in. 
So that was sort of the things that we were thinking about. And then we decided to put together a program. And let me just say this was built over many, many years. And so it's completely irrational to think that some, an institution could build this in a matter of months or a year, but at least to learn a little bit from what we've done, some of these things could be implemented immediately. We have two workshops uh, or workshop series that we offer. They are all virtual now and we welcome people from other uh, institutions. One is called Becoming a Resilient Scientist. I'll show you some data on that uh, in a few slides. And another is our monthly mental health webinar with a variety of small group activities. We will launch December one or two, I can't remember the date. And the program, the first one is Culture and Stigma in Mental Health. We have a bunch of small group activities. Meditation is scientifically proven to decrease stress, to improve the ability to resolve conflict. It has a huge science behind it and we have drop in meditation groups. Journaling is another uh, proven uh, activity to promote well-being and wellness. You uh, can write a uh, journal through things that are bothering you, journal about new well-being well tools you learn, and we have drop-in groups. We have a small group discussions around resilience. We might pick a topic like four weeks talking, reading and talking about imposter fears or four weeks talking about how to deal with loneliness an issue for graduate students and postdocs during the pandemic, especially those who come came internationally and those who live alone was uh, an extra burden of loneliness. And so we have to find anecdotes to those kinds of issues. So we put together groups where people uh, looked at how they could build connections, even in the really constrained world we found ourselves in. You can get together, we do Thriving Thursday or Wellness Wednesday, you could probably do Fun Friday, you could probably come up with a nice uh, acronym um, or phrase for every day of the week, where people might talk about starting a wellness practice, or uh, let's, let's get together and learn a little bit about imposter fears. Some of these are led by our wellness staff, but a lot of them trickled up. They were ideas from the community and, and students uh, participate and lead the discussions. We have uh, regular wellness events, things like laughter yoga, Zumba, painting. We just did improv a few weeks ago. Uh, we've done some cooking demonstrations. Some of these only work now because of Zoom. There are so many others we'll be able to do when we're all back and able to engage. You know, if no one comes, these activities are, are really sort of a bummer, right? But if you just focus on the people who are there um, and you slowly work to build traction, you realize that for an hour you laughed, you connected. Resilience is people, right? That's a big part. People plus process, taking care of yourself. So these kinds of events are the people part. They are that protective factor of not being isolated. And finally, we support our affinity groups and hosting lunches and discussions, inviting speakers from the community, often senior mentors, uh, to talk a little bit. We provide wellness advising and consultations uh, with PIs and research staff. That is not easily done at the start. You have to have experts for doing that. Some of these other things are more easily done at the start. We also have talked with mental health providers in the community, made sure that we understand uh, the health insurance our trainees have. These are things you can advocate for with your program leaders. If there are PIs and program leaders here, I have found one of the best uses of my time are some conversations with mental health providers in the community. And finally, we realized that it was our responsibility to drive institutional policy that supports health and well being. For example, an email went out last week talking about time off for COVID uh, vaccines. It didn't say anything about trainees. And so we said, could you just reissue that email um, and include trainees? Trainee leave policies would be a policy that promotes wellness, making sure. Uh, that trainee insurance has outstanding mental health benefits. These are the kinds of policy changes people can advocate for. 
We've learned a lot in the seven years that we've been doing this. It takes a lot of time to gain traction. People, this is a message where people have heard again and again not to come, right? They're not judged or valued. They're not judged positively or valued for coming. So why should they? And so it's going to take time to change that culture. So people will come when they come. You can make it easier for them to come by embedding little micro wellness messages and everything. You're talking about interviewing, spend two slides talking about stress management during interviewing, grant writing, talk about a, a resilience, a time when you need resilience, just embed a few slides. You can also make it harder for people to avoid these programs by embedding them in orientation, in program retreats. Those of you who are on retreat committees or uh, steering committees for students, ask that there be a wellness talk at an event. I think it takes constant regular messaging. It takes modeling from people who matter. Find your advocates and ask them to help. One thing I'll say from the pandemic that we learned is that trainees outside NIH see our programs and ask to come. Can I, I see this says NIH only any chance I can come anyway. I think that says that there's some need for these programs. We sometimes have very small numbers and you know we've stopped focusing on numbers and we've started focusing on the energy and the feeling and the outcome. I wanna tell you a little bit about that. Resilient Scientist series. Early in the pandemic, we did two talks that were mobbed and the questions went on and on. It was strategies and tools for dealing with stress and becoming a Resilient Scientist pandemic edition. So I started randomly offering talks, developing feedback resilience, self-advocacy for scientists, dealing with cognitive distortions, imposter fear, stereotype threat. They were based on questions in these two webinars. And then one day I realized it was totally disorganized. So we put it together in a series called the Resilient Scientist Series. It is based on this triangle here. The this is really the underlying principle of cognitive behavioral therapy. And that is that our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors are inextricably linked. Change one, you change the others. So if you have very negative thoughts and imposter fears, they're going to make you feel pretty, uh, you know, isolated, like you don't belong. And that's going to drive behaviors that isolate you further. If on the other hand, you work to make your thoughts more positive, your emotions will follow and behaviors will follow at the simplest level, change one, change the others. So we decided to give people, started with behaviors, how to take care of yourself, thoughts, cognitive distortions, imposter fears and such, and our feelings as a basis for learning about assertiveness, feedback and mentoring. We have offered this a number of times. There's a lot of goals that we have of this program, one being uh, to provide specific tools, but others to be providing a common language, normalizing challenges, decreasing stigma around taking time for yourself, a lot about self-awareness. Why do I struggle with what I struggle with and why do I do really well in some areas and not others? What can I do about it? It's a really honest discussion of power dynamics, the culture of science. We try to talk about bias and how structural racism, structural sexism, uh, structural elements in our community can drive individuals' negative thoughts and feelings so that there's a context around what's happening. Our hope is that this will take off as a, an avenue for people to really talk about how they take care of themselves and how to make change within the community. Sometimes people say, just change the culture of the community and we won't need all of this. But the honest truth is how, oh, I want to go back. How we take care of ourselves, how we manage our distorted thinking, how we uh, deal with unhelpful or uncomfortable emotions is the foundation of success in life and work. So yes, the culture of science needs to change, but the honest truth is even without a difficult environment, we all need to know these skills. We've taught colleagues at NIH and colleagues on about 50 to 60 campuses how to run the small group discussions that follow each webinar. 
So the webinars follow these now five, we've put feelings embedded into all of these. So there are five webinars and five small group discussions. We've trained lots of people in how to run the small groups. There is a kit that you can get uh, that provides the guides and, and is helpful in running the discussions. I just wanna show you a little bit of data. This is from what we have called the RTP1 audience. It's the first round that we did with about 40 schools. Very diverse uh, group of individuals taking uh, the series, more women than men, quite dramatically, pretty broad ages, and people came from anywhere to one to about six, or not about six, to six of the series. People really enjoyed it. They would recommend it to a friend. They found it valuable and they said they learned a lot. And that is independent of gender, race, ethnicity, or education level, meaning undergraduate students up to postdocs said, this was valuable to me. Now, the honest truth is we have a huge amount of attrition. We start with about a thousand people in the first unit and we are way down. People show up for one group or no groups. Uh, some people stuck through it. And what we learned was that the people who stuck through it really made change. So this is now looking at people who attended less than half, people who attended more than half. More than half gained important skills that helped at work and at home, managed, feel they managed conflict better, stress better, they felt more resilient, and very intriguing to me that they felt that they were becoming better scientists. This was about 400 and uh, some people, so a very large sample size. Now of that 400 and some, 217 of them completed a pre-assessment and a post-assessment where we used questions to get at issues around their resilience, uh, non-clinical anxiety and depression, a variety of factors that would be important for success at work. And here we are looking at the comparison of the pre-score and the post-score. So there was an increase in resilience, an increase in self-efficacy, meaning I feel like I can take care of myself and solve problems, a better ability to shift and persist, I can see that I have to change directions to solve this problem, or I can see I need to stick with it, and much more self-awareness around development, all really good things. Now, some things decreased, presenteeism, which is when you show up, but you don't really give a damn, right? You're not really working. Perceived stress decreased, and non-clinical anxiety and depression decreased. So these webinars and the small groups seem to have had a very positive impact. And over a relatively long period of time, we assess this many months out, we're actually in the middle of assessing it again. There were some really interesting differences based on gender and race and ethnicity that we need to evaluate carefully, but the data show equal or greater efficacy from trainees from underrepresented groups. I was worried because I do the webinars, um, you know, I have a very senior solid position, come from um, a very privileged community. I worry a lot about resonating from, for students from really diverse backgrounds. And we are spending a lot of time thinking about that. And so we're looking pretty carefully at how the data resonate for each community. We can't really distinguish the impact of the webinars alone versus the webinars plus small groups yet, but we should be able to do that soon. However, take home message, this really helps. It makes people feel less alone it gives really tangible skills, but it is not a one hit wonder. You really need some of those other activities and coming to one thing is a little bit of a, it's probably a help for a short period of time, but the half life's probably pretty short. Three comments we hear all the time. I wish I heard this sooner. This should be mandatory and this takes too much time and it does take time. Take home message. If we wanna change the culture of science, if we wanna feel better ourselves within science, we're gonna to have to take some time. I am puzzled and frustrated um, about the gender gap in participation. It will likely slow culture change. You know, everyone needs to be at the table having these discussions to make change. 
Interestingly, men who attended said it was very, very helpful, but only 20% of all participants were men. And that's over like six offerings now. And we know it's about 50-50 uh, gender wise. So one thing is this series alone is not enough in the absence of that broad culture change. We have to address our culture of overwork. And furthermore, I think it is totally immoral and irresponsible to ask students to weather really unwelcoming and unsupportive climates. I mean, let's be honest, if we line up PIs, we're gonna find great mentors and good mentors and good enough mentors. Then we find absent mentors, we find unkind mentors, and let's be honest, we find environments that are harassing and bullying that are completely demeaning, right? Or tormenting environments. And I think we all need uh, to um, look at this. You know, so if money weren't an issue, leadership needs to say, what are we gonna do about helping PIs improve their skills? And what are we gonna do to help students change groups when they are in a really poor environment? I am gonna not talk a lot about this because I think most people here are students. I, I do wanna say one thing that, that trainees have a role to play here in carefully choosing the right environment and in paying attention to anti-bullying and anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policies and taking care of themselves. The data on trainee mental health shows that a supportive mentor is protective. We see many fewer uh, issues in trainees in supportive labs. Not to say that mental illness you know, is associated with poor mentoring. I mean, sadly, mental illness is an equal opportunity um, you know, issue. It, 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 we all face uh, issues with our mental health. And some people face really much more serious issues than others. But when you are in a supportive place, there are, it's easier to get used resources. It's easier to take the time you need. I think we really, really need to be thinking about how we select mentors and what we do when we find ourselves in an environment that doesn't work for us. At NIH now, we offer a talk called Your Rights and Responsibilities as an NIH trainee. And I have to say every time I'm just totally um, both optimistic that we're having these open discussions and really, really devastated by the difficult stories that are and questions and comments that are put in the chat. We owe you so much better. And I realized that when it comes to dealing with toxic environments, the responsibility or bulk of it really rests with the leadership. In the long term, change really will happen when we work at the individual group, institution, and community level. You can do a lot at the individual level. Put environment first when choosing positions. Take good care of yourself. Join. Uh, take part in communities, show up at well-being events, because if no one shows up, they won't happen again, and you'll end up enjoying it. And really make time to learn positive coping strategies and relationship management skills. We have to change this culture where we believe that we don't need training in that. At the group level, retreats and lab meetings can focus on well-being and resilience. We can have a discussion of stress management in IDPs. And I love the idea of snow days. We have them all the time in the OITE. It's not snowing. They come in July. It's just a chance for everybody to get outside or go spend time with family, do what makes them feel good. At the institutional level, we need strong anti-harassment and anti-discrimination policies. If you have a voice, make it clear that there needs to be a student advocate involved in the system. Here at NIH, if trainees file a harassment complaint, the body responsible for investigating that has to reach out to our office to make sure the trainee is taken care of. Educational safety, right? Letters of recommendation, my place on papers. Anything that you can do to drive those types of policies. Those of you who are on board of uh, 
boards and groups in your scientific society, push the society to hold wellness events that don't conflict with science. Why should you have to choose between a science talk and a well-being talk? Eventually, I think as we have this discussion with funders, we have to talk about making fellowships easily transferable when fit and poor mentoring and climate come into play. We have to support you better. I really cannot stress enough that for me, one of the good things that will come out of the pandemic and more discussions like this, the invitation that you uh, extended to me, the fact that so many of you are here. And as I said, I wish there were more here, but still all of you are a part of making change for the better just by coming here today. Lots of people have worked on this with me. Lots of people have shaped my feelings about this. Um, and I want to just acknowledge all of them in this slide. I have some time uh, to uh, answer questions and I am uh, really ha uh, happy to do that. So I'll take a look in the chat and stop sharing. And Patrick, if you saw something that you really want me uh, to talk about, uh, let me know, okay? Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, I think there is actually one question in the chat right now. And then I actually had a question that I wanted to ask you, but I'll let the chat go first. Okay, so uh, there's a, a comment here about the cognitive triangle as an interesting and concise way to conceptualize thoughts and how it impacts our performance. I'd like to really encourage you. So that entire Resilient Scientist series is online. I think when it comes to imposter fears, which are such a challenge for our trainees, and actually, quite frankly, lots of PIs, it's a really helpful model for normalizing them. So the talk on imposter fears is number two. It's the Resilient Scientist uh, series number two. And you can find it on our YouTube channel. You can share the slides with anybody uh, that you want to. Um, if you can't, if somebody didn't put the YouTube in the chat, um, I will make sure um, everybody uh, gets it. Um, there are a number of comments about affinity groups that I just really want to uplift and echo. I, um, I think that's such a, it is such an important thing to gather in community. And while we all share the identity as a scientist who wishes to make the world better through our work, so we are all a part of one big community, I think it's important to also acknowledge all of the other uh, identities that we carry with us to work. And I don't think we've done a good enough job of that. And so I, I want to acknowledge that uh, you're uh, here, the ASPB sponsors some affinity groups. One of the ways when you're isolated in a smaller campus that doesn't have affinity groups, the way, one way to address that is to start on your campus and you might not be in a position to do that. You might be, you know, it's just not a, you don't have time right in that moment. Find allies who can help you do that. But the second answer is to do, uh, is to use national organizations like this. Um, I think that I've addressed everything um, in the chat. If not, I believe I have a question here in the Q and A panel um, oh, for Dr. Nemhauser, um, and she asked, um, "Fantastic talk um, and wonderful to see spotlight on such an important topic." I have many questions, but one for now: Did I understand that the webinars are for trainees and not PIs? If so, can you discuss whether "quote unquote" mixed group trainings would be a good idea? Are likely problematic. Yeah. I am thinking about the effects of the positive effects of role modeling versus potential power differentials. Yeah, thank you. So becoming a resilient scientist is actually for trainees only, although it's a webinar and I have no idea who's on the webinar and I can tell you that uh, it's a mixed audience in the webinar, but in the small groups, we only welcome trainees. In fact, we try to put near peers together. So grad students and postdocs together, undergrads and postbacs. Um, you know, we try to, to make it a near peer experience. The reason we do that is a lot of the discussion is around challenges around power and people talk about their PI and we would never want 
uh, there to be an issue where there was a power dynamic uh, emerging in that group. That said, my goal, so Dr. Collins, who is currently the NIH director, and I spoke about resilience in June or July, and he gave me some funds to expand some things. And using those funds, I'm going to host, I hope starting July, something called Raising a Resilient Scientist, which will be for PIs and give them a chance to learn this material, both from their own perspective, quite frankly, PIs struggle with negative thoughts and distorted stories and a lack of assertiveness. They uh, struggle with feedback. All the things trainees struggle with when I give the talk to PIs, they say these, these are hard things for us as well. So we'll be doing this for PIs in January um, and advertising it through various listservs and on Twitter. That said, I think some discussions on wellness in a mixed group would be a really, really good idea. And I was a little bit hesitant to do that. Um, as I was thinking about what I was shying away from, I realized one thing were, was dis mixed group discussions. And we've done a few since the start of the pandemic. Um, trainees have reflected that it can be hard to ask questions in a mixed group, but they also have reflected that it can be very um, uplifting to hear this material in a mixed group. Um, this, I see a question here, uh, what's a good way to introduce this type of training to a resistant professor? Uh, have departments led well-being trainings. Uh, oops, I didn't see the rest of that. Oh, um, oh I can. Yeah, that, that was great. It's no problem. Uh, that's mandatory for professors. Yeah. So first of all, I am a big believer that you can't make anybody do what they don't want to do. Um, I mean, that's actually a parenting principle that you learn um, the hard way. I really struggled with hearing that. Um, but I think it's really true. One of the reasons why I think some of the work is in helping trainees choose more wisely and also helping trainees get out of negative environments is some people are resistant and they are not going to make any change. So I don't want to be totally negative about that, but I think it could be very challenging if somebody's totally resistant. However, there are many people who aren't totally resistant, they're flummoxed, they're frustrated, they never learn these skills. I started my lab, they said, here's your rooms, good luck, right? And then the next thing I know, I have a bunch of students and I'm not always behaving so well. But part of it was a lack of education, part of it was, uh, you know, to do well, you have to be well, right? And if I'm exhausted, I can't be the best mentor. I didn't have very much training around diversity and inclusion. Actually, when I think about it, almost none. So there's a large number of people who haven't had a lot of training that want to do better. And those uh, PIs need to be supported in getting training. They need to be rewarded for doing it. We need much more coaching when things aren't going well. And I have seen lots of change in that regard. At UCSF, a couple of years ago, I went and visited and they were kicking off a program where if you took a student through a training grant, you had to do some mentor training. And actually it was a really positive, uplifting discussion. Many people would like to do better. So the really resistant, I think universities need to make it clear that mentoring is a right um, I mean, is a responsibility, not a right. You don't get to have trainees just because you're a faculty member. You get to have trainees because you take care of them. That's a culture change that will take a long time. I've been saying at NIH for years now, if we put the money in the hands of the trainees and not the PIs and they could change labs easily, we might deal with some issues much faster. It's just culture change is hard. Um, you, however, all of you, you are the future, whether you're in academia or industry, whether you go into education or policy, you will be the ones shaping these discussions. And that gives me some hope, to be totally honest, some culture change takes new ideas and disruptors, right? Like we need to view ourselves as disruptors. That is very hard to do uh, in a hierarchical situation. 
and we cleared the Q&A. Did we clear the, uh, we did. It looks to me like, um, like we covered everything in the chat. Okay, yeah. so. Patrick mentioned you had a, a question at the beginning. Did you wanna, do you have time to answer that one or, or ask it if you want to? <laughs> Um, I'll put you on the spot, but <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead, Patrick. I have a few minutes. <laughs> just real quick, um, I guess I was asking about um maybe conflict dynamics in the lab, um, because like I think very often scientists might be more likely to be introverted, and um sometimes it's something as simple as just like a conflict over space in the lab, and how how do you and that could just kind of like scale up into a whole bunch of issues with the lab and wellness. How do you recommend or suggest um, PIs um, manage that kind of like interpersonal dynamic between postdocs and graduate students in the lab? And how do they foster that kind of environment where people can work together and get along? Because I feel like some PIs kind of focus on like the technical stuff, but you know, people don't necessarily develop into the kind of people that you'd want to work with on the bench. Yeah. So it is a really learned skill, how to have difficult conversations, how to uh, bring both your, I got to take care of myself side to work and I'm responsible to a community to work. This is a learned skill. And if PIs want to foster uh, relationships focused on problem solving and respect and discussing issues, A, they have to model that behavior. And B, we all need training in conflict management, in hearing, giving and receiving feedback. I don't think this comes naturally to anybody. And I'm not sure why we pretend that it does, right? We can be very well-intentioned. And those of us um, you know, some of us have too powerful a communication style. Some of us hold a lot in. That's just who we are. And we all need training to bring who we are to work and welcome others uh, and, and find ways to resolve issues. So if a PI wanted an environment that really did a great job in that regard, they would refer people to the ombudsman's office at the institution. When there was an issue, they would consult themselves. They would make sure if there was a conflict management workshop, they encouraged everyone to go. There are some great books. Crucial Conversations is one. Thanks for the Feedback is another. They would read those books, share those books, talk about those books. We started all of our lab meetings with uh, kudos and, and, and issues, right? What happened great? What do we need to work on? And I realized in hindsight, well, that was a nice little idea, I should have provided more training to people in my group. And that's what I think is a big part. By the way, to Thursday this week is um, our, uh, it's the fourth unit and it's on feedback. And so if anybody wants to come, they can just send me an email and I'll send you the link. You can pick up the series midway. It's not exactly about conflict, Patrick, but we address difficult conversations a lot. Last week was assertiveness, and I can send the link to that one. Well, thank you both again, especially Patrick. I, I really appreciate you taking the lead with organizing this to you and, and your subcommittee. Um, this has been a really great conversation, and I'm, I'm so thankful that we were able to put this together. Thank you, Sharon, for speaking. And also thank you everyone for joining. I also, huge shout out to everybody who's been sharing resources in the chat. I'll save those and we'll post them to the Early Career Plant Scientist Network on Plant A. Um, I've, I've sent some links and, and want to put, just point out again that there's some groups already on Plant A um, to build community. And if there's any that are missing, um, reach out to me and we can we can have a conversation about that and, and see what we might be able to set up. Um, this has been a really pow powerful conversation and I hope you're all feeling encouraged. Great. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.